Gospels to 2 Samuel chapter 8. 2 Samuel chapter 8. I was outside this morning in the parking lot talking to speaking with somebody and the geese were flying overhead in the direction they fly for the winter. And a reminder to me was, you need to get through the life of David because now it's fall and time is coming short. This evening we're going to be beginning our fall uh, last days series and uh, Pastor Levesque will be preaching tonight. Today's Rosh Hashanah. And so what a great way to start. Those of you who have been part of these eschatological conversations with us in the past know the significance of that. And then tonight we'll also be observing the Lord's table. And so perfect, all together. So you make plans on being here this evening. And he'll be preaching uh, the last day's series for the next four Sunday nights. And so you want to be a part of that. Second Samuel chapter 8. All of that to say, hurry up and get through the life of David. Jesus is coming back. <laughs> Lord, you don't have to wait on me. We can see any time. we just go. <laughs> Second Samuel chapter 8, verse 1, the Bible says this. And it came to pass that David smote the Philistines and subdued them. And David took Methagama out of the hand of the Philistines. That was like their metropolis, their mega city. And he smote Moab and measured them with a line, casting them down to the ground. Even with two lines measured, he put to death and with one full line to keep a life alive. And so the Moabites became David's servants and brought gifts. David goes on and does this and look down at verse 6 to other nations. Then David put garrisons in Syria of Damascus, and of the Syrians became servants to David and brought gifts. I want you to notice this phrase here in verse 6. And the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. David found himself with the force field on. In the middle of God's will, full of devotion, untouchable. Look down at verse 14. And he put garrisons in Edom. Throughout all of Edom put he garrisons, his armies. And all they of Edom became David's servants. And look there again. And the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. I want to preach to you this morning, entitled this, a protected heart. A protected heart. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the example of David. Lord, I pray that we would have a heart that worships you. And Lord, in that, we would understand your protection that you bring in our lives. Lord, help it to build the confidence and the character that comes along with that. Lord, we love you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Last time we were together, we learned that a heart that worships Christ responds to the astounding blessings of God with authentic devotion to God. You remember David went beyond what God had been directing him to do. David found himself in a palace sitting on the king's throne, the king of Israel, the once shepherd boy, the once vagabond, the once fugitive was now king over God's people. And God had blessed him in so many ways and brought peace and had given, the Bible says, David rest. David was contemplating the presence of God, which was represented in the Ark of God, the Ark in the Old Testament, Raiders in the Lost Ark, that one, Ark, the Ark. And, and, uh, And David said, how do I live in this house? And the Ark lives in a tent. And he has this devotional thought. We're going to build a house for God. Now, what was astounding about this was God did not ask him to do this. Now, it was God's intention and it was God's plan plan to do this. God put it in his heart, but it wasn't a law. It wasn't a direct command from God, thou shalt do this. It was the outspring of David's worship for God. An act of devotion. Of course, David communicates this to the prophet. The prophet confirms it. God gives David a message and says, yes, 
This is wonderful that this is in your heart. I never asked for it. But because you have done this, because this is in your heart, God gives David this eternal promise that's still in effect today that determines our eschatology a little bit. And, and that is that his lineage, that uh, uh, the family of David would never leave, leave the throne of Israel. Would always sit upon crones. Of course, Jesus is the embodiment of that, or the fulfillment of that promise. And so it's on that stage in which we come into chapter 8. David, who finds himself the king of a nation at rest, goes on the conquest, begins to do battle against God's enemies, begins to, uh, begins to do these uh, battles or, or fight these enemies and expand the kingdom. David's heart, full of devotion, produces a life full of exploits. And that's what chapter 8 is all about. Chapter 8 is a summary. This is over the course of time, David going through these exploits where he is defeating these enemies and inhabiting the land that God had promised him. Chapter 8 summarizes these exploits of of David conquering six nations and spoiling others. He conquers the Philistines and the, the Moabites and Zebo and the Syri- uh, 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 Syrians and Hamath and the Edomites. Now, what's particular about these six nations, and there's others that he spoils. What I mean by that is they saw what David was doing to the other nations, and they just gave up. They said, we're not going to fight you. Here's the spoils. Here's the riches. We are your servants and your slaves. Uh, you, we are your servants now. But David uh, conquers these six particular nations. And what's, what's interesting about them is if you were to look at them on the map, you would see that David is expanding the kingdom to the north, to the south, to the east, and to the west. Well, what David is doing is claiming the promise of God. I mean, these are, this is the land that God has given him, and David is not, is not acting in a restorative fashion. He is acting in a conquering fashion. These were, up until this point, unfulfilled or unrealized promises, and David is cashing in. And David is saying, listen, God, you've given this to us. We are out of devotion. We are going to conquer this land, or we're going to expand the territories to what you have promised your people. David is expanding the kingdom according to the promise God had given Israel concerning the land. So David is taking what is theirs. And in in so doing, he begins to expand the borders of Israel. But David does so with confidence. David does so almost with an air of invincibility. Now, this invincibility is not self-confidence and not in his own ability. But this is the uh, invincibility, or, or maybe the better word, confidence, that is originated from the walk with the Lord that David was experiencing in this moment. You see, this heart of devotion, this being right with God, this knowing that that you're in tune and in the will of God, when you are in the will of God, you can never get outside the protection of God. And David understood that this battle, these conquests, were all part of God's plan and his will. And David was able to get on the battlefield with no fear. We'll learn later on in his life that it was David's practice to fight amongst his men. Later on, he would stay back, and that was his demise. So you imagine here, David is putting it all on the line every single day. Uh, he, he's not staying safely back in the, in the palace. He is fighting and conquering and conquesting for God, according to the promise. In verse 6, we see that David is operating with this Heir of protection from God. And the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. We see it repeated there in verse 14. And the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. Once again, he finds himself with the full assurance that accompanies a heart full of worship of Christ. But we talk about a heart that worships Christ. And our heart ought to worship Christ because he is worthy of all our worship. Uh, our hearts ought to be surrendered to Christ because he is worthy of all our surrender. But beloved, God knows that you, or God designed you to worship him, and when your heart is worshiping Christ, you operate understanding 
the sense of protection from God. The heart that worships Christ thrives in the protecting presence of God. And that's our big idea this morning. The heart that worships Christ thrives in the protecting presence of God. Beloved, do you feel vulnerable this morning? Insecure? Unsure? Full of doubts? Not not steady on your feet? Then worship Christ. It's in the environment, it's in that heart of devotion, that confidence in God's plan and God's plan in your life begins to build that you begin to have the security that God intends for those that worship him. God's children ought not to be insecure, but ought to be secure. Secure in the love of their father. Secure in their eternal state. Secure, secure in that what they're doing today is what God has ordained them to do. Beloved, you can have that security. You, you can know what it is to operate in the protection of God. Let, let's say three things about this this morning. First of all, the place of God's protection is in Christ. The place of God's protection is in Christ. Here, David is recognizing the the clear and present dangers that surrounded him. These nations. And beloved, there is a clear and present danger in your life. And your insecurity or your lack of feeling secure is not a result of your circumstances. The greatest threat in your life today is sin not circumstances. We spend more time being afraid of circumstances than rather just being afraid of sin. In other words, that's the threat in my life. The the, the danger in my life is the consequences of sin in my life that then usually produces the circumstances that we don't want. God is in control of the circumstances that are outside of your control. And you can walk with God in such a way that you have confidence in that, that he is in control of the things that you cannot control. But the thing that ought to make the believer most insecure is when that there is sin present in their life. Sin is your greatest threat. Sin is the issue. They say, no, Pastor Jay, you don't understand. No, the issue is my bank account. No, no, the issue is my, me and my spouse cannot get along. The issue are these children that I'm raising that are running around on their and I can't control. These are the issues. And beloved, what I'm telling you is that the solution to those issues is worshiping Christ. The insecurity comes when we get outside of Christ by doing things our own way. And that's a clever way of saying sin. <laughs> Isn't that what it is, right? Sin is just doing things our way, not God's way. Now, it's much worse than that, but it is that. While God's strong hand of providence does protect us from many circumstances and accidents, it is his merciful protection from sin that the worshiper values the greatest. This is why we sang this morning, though my sins be many, his mercy is more. We we didn't sing, "Though though the roads are dangerous, he got us here safely. Now we could sing that. Uh, Though I work in a dangerous job, he didn't let me fall off the ladder. We could sing that, but, but what's really worthy of his praise? No, no, the biggest issue, the biggest problem is though my sins are many, his mercy is much more. Sin is your greatest threat. Sin is our greatest source of insecurity. Sin is the near, the clear and present danger in every single person's life. Protection from sin, which is the, the place of God's protection, is found in Christ. And protection from sin is found in Christ, first in salvation, then in sanctification. Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, the Bible says this, there is, therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Be in Christ. 
who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. First of all, beloved, you are protected in Christ from sin by salvation offered by Jesus Christ. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death. And the only payment for that wage that satisfies a holy and righteous God is the payment that Jesus made on the cross of Calvary, his own son. Gee, it's being in Christ that saves us from sin. David is a picture of being in Christ. Now, he's not only a picture, he was. Jesus in the Old uh, David in the Old Testament was worshiping Jesus. He he knew, he knew Jesus. He walked. He uh, he had a, an abiding relationship with Jesus. David was saved the same way you and I are saved by placing faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Protection from sin is first found in salvation. Paul said to the Corinthians, "For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ." shall all be made alive in Christ. You must be in Christ. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. Beloved, it's very, the Bible is very black and white about this. Very clear. You're either in Christ or you're not in Christ. Now, those of you that are in Christ go, I know what you're talking about, Pastor. That when I got saved, Jesus washed away all my sin by his blood, and I am saved from the eternal uh, consequences of my sin. Jesus paid the punishment for my sin, and I'm assured an eternal home in heaven. But, beloved, if you are here this morning and you say, I don't know what it means to be in Christ, or I don't know if I am in Christ, but I sure want to be. The Bible says that these things are written that you might know that you have eternal life. You can know whether or not you are in Christ. The Bible says this, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When you are in Christ, you are made a new creature. All those old things are passed away. Beloved, outside of Christ, there is no security. But inside of Christ, there is perfect security, perfect protection. What can remove us from the love of God? Nothing. Who can pluck us from the hand of God? No one. There is great security there. The place of protection, particularly in salvation, is in Christ Jesus. But not only in salvation, but going on from there in our own sanctification. In other words, in our separation unto God. Do you believe, do you know that there is not only protection from sin in the transaction of salvation in your life, but also in the working of sanctification in your life? That's that's what God does in us after we get saved. We, he is sanctifying us. The, the, the process of drawing us closer to him, learning about his word, walking in the spirit, separating ourselves from sin and living unto Christ. Beloved, we ought to be separate from the world and we ought to be separate from sin, not, not simply because we're old fashioned. And beloved, that's not old fashioned. That's just biblical. But because there is a protection in doing so. Usually, and I'd almost want to say always, when you find a believer that is overcome in insecurities, what you'll find is a place, a place in their life that is overcome with sin. An area there that, that there is an insecurity realizing that, they, that the, whole, the Lord Jesus Christ is not, they're not walking with him in that space towards their own sanctification. Now notice how this is illustrated here in chapter 8. David was ruling this kingdom. The the, the nation of Israel had its boundaries, but David was creating a space between Israel and the nations that would lead Israel astray by going into idolatry. 
And so notice what's happening here. Israel is smaller. God had promised them to be bigger. David is fulfilling those promises in Christ, in the Lord. And as that is happening, their realm of influence is growing in the region, thereby pushing further away from their core the very nations that would tempt them into idolatry. They're growing. The the space between. If you want to put Jerusalem at the center, the the space between Jerusalem and invading armies, the the, the space between Jerusalem and counter-influences is spread apart. This was particularly seen in the defeat of the Moabites. We see that in verse 2, and he smote Moab. Notice he measured them. He killed half of them. The other half, they became servants. In Genesis chapter 19, verses 36 and 37, we understand that Moab was the incestuous son of Lot, Abraham's backslidden nephew. They occupied the land adjacent to Canaan, with the Jordan River dividing them from Israel. Particularly in the book of Numbers, they are seen as the tempters of Israel to leave God and go after the world. And so here we can illustrate that that Moab is a picture of worldliness or a picture of the influence of the world or a picture of the culture of the world. One commentator wrote it this way. Every fair, attractive, worldly delight that makes us forget our true home is a daughter of Moab. Here, David is creating this space, not only only claiming the promises that God had given them, but creating a separation between God's people and the people of the land. The the very gods that God had told them that they should have no other gods before them. Not only was David capturing the land, but he was also creating a space. The place of God's protection in your life practically is the space created by worshiping God. Jesus. Now follow what I just said there. The space of protection, the bubble of invincibility that we were talking about earlier. And what's our greatest threat? Sin, not circumstances. Sin is our greatest threat. Even for the believer's life, because it harms our walk with God. Harms are abiding in Jesus. The place of God's protection in your life practically is the space created by worshiping Christ. John the Baptist got this. What did he say? He must increase, I must decrease. See, beloved, as worship suffers in our life, what you're going to find is the world creeping in all around you. You ever, uh, listen, being a big guy, I can get into a tight space and feel a little claustrophobic. You ever been there? You can't move your shoulders. I, I, one time when I was in the Philippines, we went spelunking down into a, that's cave dive, diving. And we were getting into a spot, and these were like little Filipino people who were taking Goliath into the cave. And I don't believe they have the same, like, safety requirements as we have as caves here in the United States. Like, the evacuation system was a rope tied together. There wasn't an elevator. And so we were going, and we're going through this, and I start getting to myself to a spot, and I'm like, yeah, this is too tight, too close, too deep. we got to stop, because I don't trust that these little guys are going to be able to carry or push me out of this hole. <laughs> no, 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 come on, come on. I'm like, no, 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 no. I don't want to see how this ends. I might have to wait till I'm your size before I can get out of here. And that would have been a good diet plan. There was just that moment where I felt like this is too tight. I mean, if I go any further, I'm going to get stuck. If I get my shoulder through that hole, I'm not confident I'm going to be able to get it back out. It's a hilarious picture from either end. (laughs) But have you ever feel that way about the world? Temptations around every single corner. I mean, it seems like constantly you're putting up this fight and every step of the way is this great exertion of effort. Just, oh, I, I can't look that way. I can't look this. Oh, no, everywhere I go. And beloved, you know what the problem is? Is you need to increase your worship in Jesus and create the protected space in your life so that you can walk freely and with confidence. Worship Jesus like you ought 
and the world will walk away from you a little bit. No, no, try it. Go into the Walmart, go into the grocery store. I, I, I've been with Doc Osa, he does this, and like, praise God, he's just going to worship everyone, I just worship the Lord, telling everyone about Jesus, and I watch other people, and they go down the other aisle. <laughs> I don't want to go by that guy. He's going to talk to me about Jesus. Now, that's not his intention, but that is the effect. And beloved, as Jesus is magnified in your life, he creates the space of protection. If you're feeling claustrophobic by the world, if you're, if you're feeling, man, there's no safe place. Listen, I, I understand the dangers of the world in rearing children. But my children are not being raised in an atmosphere of fear, but in great liberty. You know why? Because our worship, because I, Cindy and I determine our worship is going to be bigger than their sphere. Our sphere of worshiping Jesus is going to be bigger than the sphere that they live in so that they can operate freely. That's the privilege of parents and children at home. You, 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 are you picking up what I'm putting? Are you, are you catching this? And so here is David expanding the kingdom. Now, out of devotion, not, not because he had to, not out of threat, but he's like, no, no, we're clearing out all this territory, and there's going to be a lot of place here in Israel where God's people can just worship freely. David's doing a service for his countrymen, and we can do the same thing in our own lives. The place of God's protection in our life particularly is the space created by worshiping Christ. Hence, when a worshiper of Christ goes into the world, it is not as a participant, but rather as a noble ambassador. And when this is your heart, Christ offers you spiritual diplomatic immunity. We're in the world. We're not talking about being separatists and never go in the world. But when I'm in the world, I'm not in the world to participate with the world. I'm in the world to be an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I'm doing that and I'm worshiping him, do you know what he gives me? He gives me diplomatic immunity. Isn't that wonderful? I, I, no, no, I'm operating not in the worldliness or not in the flesh or not by the, the temperaments of the world and the passions of the world. No, no, I'm operating in the spirit and I'm operating with a worshipful heart and I'm here representing my king, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he does that, I'm not carrying your badge, I'm carrying his badge. And I got diplomatic immunity. Well, from who? From the government? No, from the king of kings and from the Lord of lords and from the real true potentate. Let me illustrate this one other way. While I go into the world, I can see every day in our community the effects of substance addiction. I, I read the reports of, in the newspaper of meth sellers being arrested. But can I be honest with you? Maybe. I have no idea where to go to get heroin or meth. If you were to ask me right now, like, hey, let's go, I wouldn't even know where to go. I have never found myself in a situation or carried myself in such a way that someone thought to approach me to sell me drugs. I've never been offered. No one's come up to me. Now, listen, I'm not bragging here. I'm just trying to illustrate this. I'm, I'm using an extreme sin because I got mine. It's called the donut shop. But... But I'm using this to illustrate this. I can tell you with, with absolute victory that, that Jesus has victory in my life in this area of methamphetamines and heroin. So that's why I'm going to use it as an illustration here. And I carry myself in such a way, as an ambassador of Christ, no one's even offered me. Wouldn't even know where to go. Now, it comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes, Right? You can be wearing a suit, be the preacher, and still be addicted. But what I'm saying here is this. As you expand his worship in your life, you will begin to see that that worship repels many temptations. Now, let me speak frankly here. If, if what I just spoke to is, is, a, is a, a devil on your back right now, and it's real, and I'm not, I'm not taking that low. I'm, I'm saying that's a real thing. Now, listen. Expand the worship of Jesus in those areas in your life. 
When you find yourself in those areas around those people, you just speak Jesus nonstop. You sing his mercy is more. You praise God nonstop. And I guarantee you, they will crawl back into the darkness because they cannot stand the light. That's what you do. But beloved, that's what you do in every area of your life. That's what you do at the donut shop when you shouldn't be eating donuts. That's what you do when the, the sinister sin of gossip wants to come out of your mouth. Change it to praise. And you'll begin to see that when your mouth is full of praise, the gossipers won't want to hang out with you anymore. See, it creates this space of protection. And that's what David was doing here. We see it all throughout. Uh, we, 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 we see that all, all here. And so I dare say you, I dare say that what plagues you what plagues you find, I dare say that what plagues you finds you where you walk not in Christ. Whatever it is that's plaguing you, I guarantee you, is in an area in your life where you walk not with Christ. Be in Christ. God's protection is found in Christ. Get in Christ. David illustrates that this with the expansion of the kingdom. My next two points are going to be very short. Number two, the peace of God's protection is confidence. When you have God's protection in your life, now you begin to have confidence. Because, listen, there's no dart. There's no evil that can touch me. Greater is he he that is in me than he that is in the world. Uh, I'm doing what the Lord has commanded me to do. And I'm worshiping the Lord with a pure heart. and, And he knows my intentions. And he knows my heart. And that's all that matters. And when you find yourself in that place, you can have great confidence, even when the rest of the world says to have none. David, in the midst of God's protection, began pursuing the promises of God, particularly the land. David was leading the expansion of God's promises, not the restoration of God's promises. I have one point here I want you to grab a hold of. The peace of God's protection is where we have opportunity to intentionally grow. Notice, according to chapter 7, David already had rest. And now he was using rest to advance. There's something, and I think this fits us right where we're at here at Emmanuel, and right where many of you are right now in your Christian life. Because a lot of the lessons that God has taught you has been through hardship, through conflict, through disappointment, and all those things, okay? Defeats. But that's not the only way to grow. And notice what David is doing here. This is not an illustration of the things that God taught me through the course of trial. But rather, this is an illustration of the things that God can teach us when we have times of peace. Beloved, don't be the type of believer that only learns when God knocks you on the side of the head. Because guess what he's going to do? All right. (laughs) There was the easy way and there was the hard way to get this in your life. You chose the hard way. And his way is hard. He will make it hard. It doesn't have to be that hard, but he will make it that hard because he loves you that much. But notice here, David, during this season of rest, determines to advance the kingdom. Constant stress and distress keeps us in survival mode. Thus, Neglecting intentional, personal growth. See, this is the difference between surviving and thriving. 
David wasn't just surviving. Now, he spent a season of that running from Saul, where he was just trying to survive. And that, there was lessons to be learned in surviving. But notice this, that David now is taking the promises of God and living them out to the fullest. And for him, that meant conquest. That means taking these, uh, these enemies of God and removing them out of the land. And David found himself in a place that out of rest, out of God's protection, he was able to thrive. Pastor Josh and Pastor Mike and I have been talking about this because we've been in this little season, a a sprint, and we've been excited doing it. But there's a part of it that goes, man, I can't wait till and we have some things planned in a couple weeks now. Because we already have plans because there's some things we need to shore up. I mean, there's some stuff in our own lives and there's some leadership things and there's some other things that we need to have some time to be able to focus in a time of rest, in a time of peace to intentionally grow us to be ready for the next battle, for the next season. And beloved, sometimes Christians do themselves such a disservice not to be intentionally growing during the seasons of rest that God gives them in their life. When all is at rest, then advance, then go. And that's what we see David being able to do here. Maybe this will resonate. It doesn't always have to be survival mode. It's actually not a good mode to live in. And I understand sometimes that's just where you're at. But you got to get out of that. And it can't always be one crisis to the next crisis to the next crisis to the next crisis. Sometimes I talk to people who are always in crisis mode, and then they go through the season without being in crisis mode, and you're talking to them, and they're almost looking for a crisis. Like, I don't know what to do when I'm not in crisis mode. How about you just thrive? How about you just grow? How about not reading a Christian book because that's what the problem you got to solve in your life right now, but because that's an area you need to grow in your life. And so David here finds himself advancing and finds himself thriving. I wonder if I can ask you this morning, what is it going to take for you to thrive? Find the peace of God's protection in Christ. See, survival mode so often is characterized by not in Christ mode. If you want to get to thriving mode, get in Christ in your life. Lastly, not only does the peace of God's, not only that the peace of God's protection is confidence, but lastly, the product of God's protection is character. Look down at verse 15. The product of God's protection. So when we have God's protection in our life, we're secure in him. It also produces some character traits. And I want you to see this real quickly. Verse 15, the Bible says this, And David reigned over all Israel. And David executed judgment and justice unto all his people. David, with the force field on, with the invincibility in the will of God, did not use that as his opportunity to become the tyrant and to get all that he wanted, but rather use the sphere of God's protection to rule righteously and justly. Grab a hold of this statement. Insecurity is the soil of self-interest. Insecurity is the soil of self-interest. Why do we not do justly? Why do we not have integrity? Why do we not have right? Because whatever that situation is, we feel insecure enough and not secure enough in God's protection that he'll take care of us, that he'll see it through, that he'll justify us, that that he'll avenge us if that's what it takes, that, that he'll provide for us. We feel just enough insecure that we have to take it into our own hands and now we become self-interested. Insecurity is the soil of self-interest. But when you find yourself in Christ, thriving in the protection of God. It's in that spot that you can truly be selfless. I don't have to think about myself. I'm right in the middle of God's protection. I don't have to check my six. 
I've never said that right. God's got me. In other words, I can keep my eyes on the task and do exactly what God wants me to do because I don't have to be self-interested. I don't have to go into self-preservation mode. I'm in God-preservation mode. And beloved, when you're in God-preservation mode, you are simply free to do right. Just do right. So when it comes to executing judgment, I don't have to go, well, what is this going to mean for me? Well, where's my piece of the pie in this thing? Where's my, well, what's, how, how is this going to affect my life? No, no. When I'm in God, when I'm like, no, God's protecting me. God has me in the center of his will. God's put this in front of me. All right, what's the right decision? What's the, well, I can make a decision with the freedom of not being self-interested because I'm in the midst of God's protection. But when I'm in self-preservation mode, self-protection mode, then every decision is suspect. Now, not only suspect to those around you who kind of go like, what? There's something. What, what, that doesn't make sense. Why are you doing that? But you know what? More importantly, you know it. You know it. And when you know it, it's hard to look in the mirror. And when you know it, it's hard to worship Christ. And when you know it, it's hard to put on the show. See what God's protection offers? It produces this character because we don't have to be in self-preservation mode. And so David here was able to rule, David was able to act justly. Because David was walking in the protection of God, in God's protection, he could rule justly, not according to self-interest or political self-interest. He could just do what was right. Secondly, turn over to 1 Chronicles chapter 18. We're landing it. The product of God's protection is character. Insecurity is the soil of self-interest. David ruled or acted justly. But I want you to see this as well. David acted sacrificially. First, Corinthians, uh, First Chronicles chapter 18 and verse 6. Now, Chronicles is the mirror to 2 Samuel and the king's passages. So it's like the, it's like the gospel kind of like. It's the same, different, same stories, a little bit different perspective, okay? And so we're over in the exact same account, exact same situation, but is recorded in the Chronicles. Verse 6, then David put garrisons in the uh, Syrian Damascus, and the Syrians became David's servant, servants, and brought gifts. Thus the Lord preserved David whithersoever he went. And look at this. And David took the shields of gold that were on the servants of Hadazer and brought them to Jerusalem. Likewise, from Tibat, Tibhath and Chun, cities of Hadazer, brought David very much brass. Now this is written kind of, with a, it's a historical percentage, so it's looking back now wherewith Solomon made the brazen sea and the pillars and the vessels of brass. Look down at verse 11. Them also King David dedicated unto the Lord with the silver and the gold that he brought from all of these nations, from Edom and from Moab and from the children of Ammon and from the Philistines and from Amalek. Walking in protection gave David the security. Walking in God's protection gave David the security that he might sacrificially give unto the Lord. Notice here, David's not collecting it for himself. I'm in the middle of God's protection. God's taking care of me more than I could have ever deserved. And so David's bringing all this stuff together. He's conquering the land. He, he's pushing the world away. He's making sure the nation is in Christ. He has the confidence of being God's protection because he doesn't have to act in self-interest. He can act justly. And because he doesn't have to act in self-interest, he can give freely. Never thinking to himself, what is this going to cost me? But rather saying, this is all the bounty of God's protection. This is all the bounty of worshiping Christ. And beloved, one of the greatest things we can do this side of eternity is give to the Lord all the bounty he gives to us because we worship him. Whew. Isn't that amazing? 
And so here is David. He's giving sacrificially. His giving was not hindered by self-interest. He was able to have this confidence that built this character. Why does a believer not give as God directs him to give? Because he's insecure. Well, maybe he's just selfish, but why is he selfish? Because he doesn't think he has enough. Or he's been cheated. Or he has to get more. But when you're in Christ, in God's protection, realizing, wait a second, look where God put, this is, this is easy. I'll just give to God. And David found that he couldn't outgive God. And that God returned it upon him fold after fold. Now, it's not why we give, but that was the byproduct of it. So, beloved, I wonder this morning, a heart that worships Christ thrives in the protecting presence of God. Are you thriving this morning? Are you walking in Christ with that protection that it offers, with the security of who he is and what that ought to produce in your life? 